Hey guys, welcome back. It is your favorite Gimp of the Limp, and I'm here with the final part of Zeppelin Raider by Compass Games. Uh, in our previous videos, we had gone over a mission. So we flew a mission out to London and did our bombing run. We didn't uh, get to go over every little aspect of the game, but you saw the basics of how it's going to play. Uh, in this video, we're just going to go over a few more aspects that we didn't cover in the previous mission. Uh, basically, how scouting is going to work and what you're going to see when you come back to base, uh, how that's going to be handled, and then we're going to cover a few final thoughts for the game itself. Now, when you're rolling for your mission, your mission assignment is going to uh, vary depending on your year up here. Uh, we see we were rolling on 1915 because that's where we were, and we got a bombing mission for London. All right, so you can get bombing missions for other places, uh, but this seems pretty about half and half. So half is going to be for scouting, half is going to be for bon, uh, bombing, and then it looks like the majority of this, let's see, London, London, London for bombs, and then we got one for Liverpool and one for Hull or Grimes, Grimes, I'm not sure how to pronounce that one. But your scouting is going to be handled similar, but not exactly the same to how the bombing's gonna run. It'll give you a target of where you're going to. So we see scouting A or scouting E, scouting F, and that has to do with these letters out here. So if we got a scouting A mission as an example, we would be flying out, or we could even come down this way, I guess, if we wanted to, and encounter A. We would want to do a scouting mission. Actually, it'd be good to go down here. Wouldn't be encountering uh, bad guys, but you're, your goal is to spot things, not necessarily destroy things. There is a counter to help you remember. See, we've got our uh, mission bombing and we could switch it out for our mission of scouting. Not exactly something that's needed, but a neat little uh, addition to the game to help you keep track. But you would continue on uh, to your area. But one of the differences is your encounters are gonna be down over here in your scouting section. And you see you can encounter aircraft, but you can also encounter ships. Now, when you're doing this section of the game, it's not just attacking the target. Sometimes they just wanted to know what was there. That's what they were using the Zeppelins for, was to see what's going on so they could send in other forces or keep track of uh, what the enemy Navy was up to. So a good thing for a Zeppelin to be doing during that period of time. So one of your options when you were doing your scouting wasn't even if you had an encounter, obviously if you had one of these, you rolled and there was no encounter while you're over these North Sea boxes, then obviously nothing's gonna happen. But if you roll for these ships, you can just radio in, as long as obviously you have a radio that's working, that's not been damaged on your Zeppelin, you can come down, there is a modifier you can get for that just a little bit and try to just radio back to base. Hey, this is what we have seen. But also you could choose to get a even better look. So you could choose to close in with your target. You're gonna get a negative two modifier to see if you have uh, positively identified something, which is great. It's gonna give you a much higher chance of positively identifying it. But if you have encountered ships and there are certain ships like battleships or cruisers there, you do have to take AA fire. So that's something you have to keep in mind. You can give yourself that positive modifier, but you are potentially going to be taking some return fire from the enemy ships. So let's say you're scouting and you do encounter a ship group. One of the things I like is they included these little counters, you know, there's ships or ship groups. And on the back, it does have the identification because on your little chart here, you can roll to see what you've identified. Like this one is, a uh, light cruiser and four destroyers. So you can pull out that counter and place it down to signify that's what you have encountered and you can attack it. You can choose to do a bombing run. You are going to have some negative modifiers when it comes to bombing the ships because obviously they're moving and bombing during this time period was absolutely not an exact science. So you're not gonna you know, be precisely laser guiding these things in. So you are gonna have that negative modifier, but depending again on the ships that you've identified, they're potentially gonna have that AA fire that they do get to fire back at you after you've done your bombing run. Now, just like the bombing runs during the city, the ships are going to have 
two attacks, two AA attacks against you. The good thing that does come from that, though, is that you it, you do get considered as positively identifying the target if you take a, uh, AA fire, because you see, again, it can be positive or probable. Well, you're positively going to identify them if they're shooting at you, so you know that uh, you've identified your target. So that's one little benefit of getting shot at. Now, unfortunately, though, if you remember when we were doing our bombing runs here in London, we could drop things like our parachute flares to help give us a modifier to, to blind the AA fire. You're not going to be able to do that when you're scouting in the ocean because the scouting missions were generally done during the day and they needed to see their targets, right? They needed to see what they were trying to identify. And as such, trying to blind them like you would at night's not going to work. So your uh, parachute flares really aren't going to do you any good in that situation. Now, there was another benefit that you could get if you identified larger targets like battleships or carriers. If you positively, you have to positively, not probable, but positively identify those targets, then you're going to get an extra prestige point on the result of a successful mission. So you got to complete the mission and come back and positively identify those guys, that gets you an extra prestige point. And obviously you're going to get that if you identify something like the Grand Fleet. Now stuff like that's going to come into play when we finish up our mission and then we can get more into this chart here. And if you complete a the selection of missions, so let's say it's uh, five missions, I do believe, if I remember right in the rule book, yep. So I've got that right here, skills. You can get extra skills for your crew for every five successful missions that they've gone on. And that will definitely come into play because you can put your counter down here for either specific crew members, like if you increase your navigator to an expert, that's gonna give you a positive modifier when trying to identify targets, or you can increase your crew from a trained crew to a veteran crew. Now, obviously this stuff is going to be dependent upon your crew actually surviving the mission they can't die and then uh, still be considered trained you're going to end up getting a green crew you do get the same type of benefit though with your commandant he's going to build up or the basically the the pilot he's representing you in the game he's going to build up skill points that he can spend and it shows here how many skill points it takes to gain these uh, bonuses which you can again mark on this sheet here to keep track of it so uh, just like other games like this you're going to keep track on your log sheet your successful missions you can have some of your missions be blocked off due to having to refit or repair your zeppelin if it's taken a lot of damage and you're going to keep track of how many points you get how many prestige points you build up how many skill points how many successful missions? And again, it has to be successful missions. It can't be an, uh, an unsuccessful mission. And once you hit so many of those milestones, you can do things like, I was pointing out, upgrading your crew, your specific crew members, your commandant himself, or when extra Zeppelins themselves start to become available, you can start upgrading into those classes of Zeppelins. There is a uh, counter in the game that signifies that you've earned an upgrade point and you can spend that to get a better Zeppelin than the one that you've actually started with. And obviously, just like other games of this nature as well, you can earn certain medals in the game or promotions for your Commandant as well, depending on how well you've done over the course of your missions. And actually, here's a nice little chart in the rule book, and this is talking about the prerequis uh, prerequisite prestige points required to move up into different classes of Zeppelins. Like you see, we start with prestige one when we're in the P class. No uh, prestige is started with if you're starting an early match, so early into the, uh, the campaign itself. But you need to have five prestige if you want to move into something like the V class or the W class or six prestige if you want to move into the X class, which is the, the top level Zeppelin that you can go to. So yeah, games like this are obviously designed to be played in a campaign mode. And one of the things that uh, someone commented on the previous video was that I just ended up rolling well, which was great. And honestly, I did roll well on that mission and you're not going to always have that happen. These games, games like this, like uh, Silent Victory, The Hunters, they, they tend to kind of be dice driven. 
in the fact that yes, you are making choices, but you're, I kind of hate to say this, but the choices you make aren't overly impactful in the fact that it uh, does come down to the dice a lot. And there's only so much you can do to mitigate that. Now, yes, you can try to succeed at your mission. So you get more modifiers in your direction and try to be smart about how you use your ballast or at what altitude you perform your attack runs. There's, there's choices that you can make, but these games tend to be won or lost based on the dice roll. Cause there are sometimes when you can play a game like this and no matter how many good choices you make and how hard you try, you're just going to get blown up because the dice gods have decided you're going to die today. You're just going to have a bad campaign and you'll end up having to start over. And then sometimes you might have a cakewalk where everything goes right for you. I mean, my mission to London was a perfect example. I had no aircraft encounters the entire way there. The AA missed. I was perfectly on target, didn't miss the navigation. And not to mention the fact that my bomb hits were supposed to be not, not that good, even though I was bombing at a low altitude. And even still, I think I only missed with one or two uh, of the ordnance out of all of it, which was rather rare. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. I ended up rolling really hot on that. I mean, that's great, but that's that's the nature of these types of games. Here's my thing on, is this going to be a game for you or not? You guys already know I like this class of game, but for me, Zeppelin Raider wasn't as big of a hit and it just has to do with the fact that I'm not personally that big into Zeppelins. I like uh, the ships more. Right? That's more my speed. So games like Silent Victory or Picket Duty do more for me. Now, I think Picket Duty has uh, more player choice in it, which I appreciate more. But if I had a choice between sitting down and playing this one versus playing The Hunters, per se, which that's almost... An identical game, all right? The the Hunters has a submarine over here instead of a Zeppelin. Thematically, for me, I'm probably going to pick the, the, the submarine just because I like that style of gameplay better. If you like World War I and you like the thought of Zeppelins, you're going to pick this one. So this game's recommendation is going to come down to basically all personal preference. You already know if you like this style of game. If you like the the easy, the dice driven, I mean, we, we already know the, the game's not hard itself. I think the biggest fault that I can give this game is not having a, uh, a sequence of play, a flow chart to go with, especially when you're starting the game. But that's something I fault all of these games for, for not having, right? So it's not specific to this game itself. It's just something these games tend not to have because it's not horribly needed. You tend to learn it pretty quick on which chart you need to go to. It's just something nice to have, but not uh, a requirement. Okay. Zeppelin Raider, not for me, but not because it's a bad game, just because I personally like other games thematically. Okay. I prefer the sub games. I prefer the ship games that are like this over the Zeppelin game, just because I'm not as interested in Zeppelins. I'm not as interested in World War One as I am in World War Two. If you're into the Great War, if you're into Zeppelins, yep, obviously wholeheartedly recommend it. But again, it's just gonna come down to personal taste for you on whether or not this is a get or a skip. All right, but that's gonna be it. That's gonna conclude my coverage of uh, Zeppelin Raider. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know we didn't cover every single aspect but games like this, you've really already understand it. If you've played one of these games, you, you know the basics of what you're going to be running into. And I'm willing to bet most of you who already like games like this already know whether Zeppelin Raiders uh, on your buy list or not. It's uh, like I said, it's up to you guys. Personal preference on that one. Anyway, that's going to be it for me. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Y'all take care. I will catch you in the next one.